T. Welcome to the 2018 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series here on the Louis T. Network. Of course, I'm your set man, Louis T. Thank you for joining me on this program as we continue to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2018 NFL Draft using our baseball grading scale single, double, triple, home run. There are no strikeouts here in the Draft Wrap-Up Series as we cannot tell how these players are going to pan out. And I don't want to discount any of these young men before they get their chance in the National Football League. And so... We'll get a score for each and every single player selected in X said team's draft, apply bonuses when necessary, get an aggregate score, divide by the number of picks, which will yield us an overall grade for that team's draft. We'll then move on to the next team in a series picked by you. That's right. You, the viewer, are in total control as this is the you pick format. Simply be the first to leave a comment in the comment section of this and future videos in this series stating two things. The phrase next and the team you'd like to see next. Some examples would be Houston next. Houston next, Texans next, Houston Texans next, Texans next, next Texans. You get where I'm going with this, man. So the next team up in the series is none other than the Houston Texans. And this was a really interesting draft because this was the first for the new GM in Houston, Brian Gain. And I thought he did what the Bears did in Chicago this year with their first round pick from a season ago, they wanted to address making sure Mitchell Trubisky was comfortable with the protection up front. But more importantly, let's make sure that this guy has weapons to get the football to. Similar approach in Houston. Hey, let's make sure that Deshaun Watson is as comfortable as he can be with not only the protection in front of him, but the guys he's going to get the football to. And so they made a concerted effort to attack some of the skill positions in this draft to get him more weaponry. Good for them. And they did look to address a, a couple of issues defensively, uh, one at the safety position, which they attacked early, and, and that was great value. We'll talk about that here in a second. And then they said, look, if we're healthy defensively, we're going to be just fine. But they did address a couple of issues defensively, but I think they were more so concerned with what they wanted to go out and get for Deshaun Watson on the offensive side of the football that they did in this draft. Let's start in this draft. Remember, the Texans were in timeout in first round this year because they went and, and came up for Deshaun Watson in the 2017 NFL draft. No first round pick in the 2018 draft. They then trade back again in this draft. So they were in timeout for the first two rounds. But once they got started, they made their picks count. We start in the third round. 68th overall selection. Safety out of Stanford. Eric Reed. Excuse me, Justin Reed, his brother, is the selection. Eric, Justin, who's keeping score anyway, right? This guy is a little bit more athletic than his brother. Not as physical as Eric Reed, but Justin Reed, I think, has what you're looking for in today's hybrid free safety, a guy that can drop over the slot. Hell, even in a pinch can go out wide, similar to Minka Fitzpatrick, a guy that if you need to, you can put him out wide against a receiver or a tight end who split all the way out wide and feel really good about what this guy's going to be capable of doing. I'm not going to break down Justin Reed here, as I've already done that in the 2018 NFL Draft um, Prospects uh, series. So if you're looking for uh, a thorough breakdown of Justin Reed, 2018 Draft Prospects 101 series is where you need to be. Go to the uh, go to the uh, channel Louis T Network. Uh, check out the playlist. And in there, you should find every prospect that I was able to get to prior to the draft, Justin Reed being one of them. But I will say this. I had a late first, early second round grade on Justin Reed. I didn't think he would actually go in the first round. But if a team took him like a Carolina that was later in the first round, wouldn't have had a single issue with that selection. Uh, didn't I thought Pittsburgh or someone like that would – maybe be keying in on a guy like Justin Reed. They elected to pass. But I said, there's no way this guy makes it out of the second round. You're sitting there in the third round, and you get a chance to snag a guy like this. I think this is tremendous value for a very versatile safety. And like I said, in today's NFL, these are the types of guys you need on your football team, guys that are multifaceted, that can do a number of different things. 
That's what Justin Reed qualifies as. And because of such, in the third round, 68th overall selection, Stanford safety, Justin Reed, for you, is... It's right high! It's a deep! It is out of here! Because of the lack of picks in the first and second round, the Texans were extremely busy in the third round. Three selections in the third round, another two or three in the fourth. So this was a team that was extremely busy once they finally got in. And here's another selection for them in the third round, this time 80th overall offensive lineman out of Mississippi State. Martinez ranking is the selection. So Martinez ranking is a very intriguing prospect, one that I think over time will grow to be even better than I have him scored as right now. I think the ceiling on this guy is tremendous, especially if a positional switch is on the horizon, which I would like to think that is the case because I don't necessarily love this guy as a tackle. I think he has some flaws in his game as a tackle, but if you kick this guy inside and really – because I don't have empirical proof of this, I'm not as bullish on Martinez ranking, just kicking inside the guard or center, which a lot of people say he's going to be a center. We'll see what the Texans decide to do with him. As long as they kick him inside, I don't have a problem with this selection. However, we don't have proof that he can play this. The good thing is he practiced all offseason in 2017 at Mississippi State at the center position, which gives me confidence that if need be, if being worked out and put in at the center position, I think he'll be able to do it seamlessly. We'll see. But let's talk about Martinez ranking and what he brings to the table here for the Texans in the third round. 6'4", 308 pounds, redshirt senior out of Mississippi State. 24 reps of two and a quarter. Played in 23 games while at Mississippi State. This is a guy that transferred over from a JUCO. So you're talking about a guy two years at Mississippi State and uh, started all of his games, all 18 of them, at the left tackle position. Uh, missed three games in 2017 with an ankle injury, 34-inch uh, arm. So he's got the requisite size you're looking for if this guy were to stay at tackle. And look, I don't think he's a horrible tackle, okay? I just think there are some flaws in his game at tackle that can't be fixed. And so... If you're in a pinch and this guy's one of your active seven linemen on game day or active eight linemen on game day, depending on how you play it, most teams like to keep seven, a swing tackle, and one interior offensive lineman. But in any event, if you were to need this guy to play tackle for you in a pinch, he could do that, and that's good to know. Uh, but in any event, his measurables, 6'4", 308, 34-inch arms. You'll take that every single day of the week. Athleticism, um, I, I have it as a positive, but, and, and I'll tell you this much, when he pulls, he's impressive, okay? The guy can move, he can get out there, and he usually engulfs whoever he's pulling out as a kickout blocker to block. So he does a really good job in terms of athleticism, in terms of his movement skills, but he's slow out of the blocks. And I think he's really threatened by elite speed. If, if a guy in front of him has elite quickness, elite speed, Martinez Rankin is going to struggle. I'll give you some examples a little bit later on. But technique-wise, he's really solid. I think his real one deficiency is the fact that he's just a little slow-footed in terms of getting out of his stance and getting uh, in a position ready to block a guy. But I will say, even when he loses off the snap, he does a great job of recovering. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Anchor is solid. Balance, the, the one thing I didn't like about his balance, and this isn't a, a, a huge knock on him, is he cut blocks a ton. And, uh, and some of that is schematics. You know, they, they three-step drop, quarterback wants to get it out quick. Hey, cut the guy in front of you so he doesn't get his hands up and get uh, a chance to deflect the football. But there are times where I don't think cut block is necessary and he's on the ground. There are a couple of times where I see him blocking a guy and he ends up on the ground unnecessarily. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of stay on your feet unless you're pancaking a guy or you're cut blocking. There's really no other reason for you to be on your feet 
off your feet, excuse me, unless you're giving a guy the business and you dump him on his skull and you pancake him and you want to put a little extra syrup on top, knock yourself out. You cut blocking, do your thing. But other than that, I don't need to see you on the ground. And uh, there are some times where just unnecessarily, you know, um, he was on the ground, not where a pile comes and he can't help himself and guy falls on his leg or something like that. No, uh, there were just times where he's on the ground. I'm like, bro, stay on your feet. You can't help anybody on the ground, especially when the guy you're blocking isn't also on the ground. Redirect is solid. Toughness, so solid as well. Um, pass blocking ability. Let's get to what I re was referencing earlier. Uh, so there were some instances where I saw him just flat out get his ass whooped and um, like I said, he does a great job of fighting his ass off to stay in a play, even when he loses initially. Uh, Miles Garrett, so I went back to 2016 because I, I knew I had an opportunity to see him against elite quickness and athleticism against Miles Garrett at, at Texas A&M. So went back, checked that out, and Garrett beat him a couple of times in that game um, off the snap with just pure quickness and, and explosiveness. Then I watched him in 2016 versus Alabama because I got another opportunity to watch that. And so um, I wanted to see how he looked against guys like Tim Ev uh, Williams and, and John Allen and, and Rashawn, uh, Rashawn Evans. And I'm here to tell you, against Tim Williams, uh, Tim Williams was able to blow by him. And then one time, Tim put a nasty spin move. So, you know, once a guy threatens you with speed early on, they get you looking for fastball. Then Tim came with a beautiful spin, beat him inside, and um, – it, it, it was ugly. Um, Rashawn Evans, boy, was he explosive a couple of times and was able to beat Martinez Rankin um, with just pure explosiveness off the edge. And so you got to see the flaw there clearly in those instances where guys were just explosive and he, he didn't have a chance out of his stance. Then, like I said, here's the beauty in Martinez Rankin is even when he gets beat initially, he fights like hell to get back into play and even if he's got to dive to get a piece of a guy just to push him around to give the quarterback a chance to step up he'll do so and so even when he's beaten he'll give his quarterback a chance to get rid of the football so i can respect that uh big time but like i said if he kicks inside he's not gonna have to worry about going up against guys with that kind of quickness and, and that kind of explosiveness with their first step he won't have to worry about kick sliding and getting out of his stance all you have to do is stand up and be ready to protect. And I think he'll be able to do that inside uh, a lot better than he can outside where there isn't a lot of help. Run blocking ability. I, I like his ability to get in the way of a guy, turn his ass and seal off defenders. I don't think he's as nasty as you would like this guy to be. I don't think he has a finish, a mean streak in him per se. Um, he's not one of these guys that's, going to necessarily devour a guy in the run game and, and dump him on his skull and and be extra with it he is a guy though that will do his job sometimes he doesn't sustain as well as i would like him to but for the most part he does a good enough job of sustaining to the point where a back can cut off of his block and and get yards um after that block is made it's not a situation where guys are stacking and shedding him and getting to the ball carrier on a consistent basis but i have seen that happen with him as well um, awareness he does know who to block when to block them which is why i think a, a move inside would be great for this man because i saw him in a number of instances pick up some te stunts pick up blitzers coming free off the edge and sometimes it wasn't even his responsibility You'd just see a guy coming out of the corner of his eye flash um and go get a piece of him and all sometimes that's all you need is a piece you don't have to go over there and and maul that guy you just got to get a piece and knock him off of his path Give your quarterback a chance to get rid of the football. And and I saw Martinez Rankin do that on a number of occasions. So I love that awareness. And I think a move inside would be awesome for this guy. Uh, pulling, I talked about that earlier. Recovery, talked about that as well. And availability, um, didn't miss three games with an ankle injury. Um, so I'd like to see him stay on the football field. But I understand the selection here. There are some things about his game that I'm not in love with, but when it's all said and done, I didn't have one uh, con, one negative on this guy. Just a bunch of things that I think he needs to improve upon. Uh, the, the one that I think stands out the most is something that he can improve on, which is why I think you kick him inside, which is I think he's a little slow out of the gate. He's a little slow out of the blocks. And explosive edge rushers will get this guy. I don't know if your division in, in, in particular has any outside of Jacksonville. 
The Colts don't have anyone that really scares you off the edge. Neither does the Tennessee Titans. Now that they have a guy like Rashawn Evans, who I think can double as a guy that can get you some pressure off the edge, uh, a guy like Martinez Rankin, I think it, it'd be a lot better suited for inside. And whether that's guard or center, doesn't really matter to me. Uh, I think this guy has the ability to do either one probably well, but we don't have substantive. Uh, we don't have substance there in terms of proof. So we don't have substantive evidence that this guy can do that. But in any event, I think this is a solid pickup for the Texans here in the third round, 80th selection overall. Mississippi State um, offensive lineman Martinez ranking for me is So this next selection here in the third round, remember I told you the Texans had three selections in the third. This is the last of those uh, three third round selections. Um, this is a guy that a lot of people were questioning, should this have been the selection here? This was a, a bit of a controversial pick for the Texans. I really like this pick, and I'll tell you why here in a second, but in the third round, 98th overall selection, tight end out of Central Florida, Jordan Atkins, or excuse me, Aikens is the selection. So, Jordan Akins is a very intriguing prospect. Um, 6'3", 249 out of Central Florida. 29 reps of 225. And this guy, if he were to do that at the combine, all of this was pretty much done at his pro day. If he were to do that at the combine, he would have been at the top of the list in terms of reps for, for tight ends, which tells you just how strong this guy really is. 35-inch vertical, 26 years old. A lot of people look at that, and that's a negative. I don't give a damn about a tight end being 26 years old. If you can play, you can play. OG85 is, what, 900 years old, and he's thinking about coming back and playing for the Chargers yet again this season. Tight end, tight end is one of those positions. Anthony Pizzano, what is he not now, like 67? He's probably going to play again because he can block. Tight end is one of those positions that if you take care of your body, you can play for a really long time in this league. And there are not a lot of really good tight ends. So if you're half decent, you can stick around for a really long time. So 26 years old shouldn't scare anyone away. Tried his hand at Major League Baseball, was drafted by the Texas Rangers, and that's what uh, accounts for this age difference from most prospects coming out of college is that he tried his hand at baseball for four years. It didn't work. And so he comes back to Central Florida where he initially was going to enroll in 2010. And so, boom, you find yourself back there in 2014. And he was a wide receiver initially for the first two years in 14 and 15. Then he got injured, okay? And when he came back, he made the switch to tight end. He got so much stronger. He was so much more physically gifted that – while rehabbing his injury, he just made they made a switch to tight end. And it was and it was to his benefit. And um, I'm here to tell you that people are sleeping on this guy. And a lot of people were saying that the Texans shouldn't have passed on guys like Ian Thomas. Now, look, I'm a huge Ian Thomas fan, and if you're looking for a guy that's much more of a, a polished pro product that I, I think is further along in his process, similar um, athletic gifts, similar size, but a lot further along in his process in terms of um, experience at the tight end position and maybe Ian Thomas would have been the selection and I, I would have loved that probably more so than this pick but I don't have a problem with this selection because I think he's a similar athlete to Ian Thomas I think the upside is just as good as Ian Thomas and I think people are sleeping on what this guy brings to the table and I think the fact that he's only been a tight end for two years gives me hope that he can be even better than a guy like Ian Thomas we'll see uh, if that turns out to be a mistake or not. Troy Fumagalli, I would have taken Jordan Aikens over Troy Fumagalli at this point because of the athletic upside that you're getting here with Aikens over a Fumagalli. But none, not, notwithstanding, let's jump into this guy and what he brings to the table. Measurables at 6'3", 250. And, and I don't know if his frame has any more to give in terms of him putting on any more weight, but the fact that he was able to blossom from a 6'3", 220, 25-pound wide receiver to a 6'3", 250-pound tight end with uh, the ability to put up 225, 29 times tells you that this guy is physically gifted and uh, you got to love those measurables. Um, and I think he's more than big enough 
uh, for the NFL game at the tight end position. Uh, speed, now, he tested at a 4.79, but I'm here to tell you with a 35-inch vert, which tells you about explosiveness, and watching him on tape, there's no way that this guy, when running on the football field, being chased by other big athletes, is running a 4.79. Uh, I put him down as a 4.68 in my notes. He looks faster than 4.79. I can't wrap my brain around 4.79. Um, he's running To me, he's running a sub 4.7. I watch the guy on tape. You tell me if you see 4.8 on tape or not. I see 4.68. I'm running with 4.68. He's separating from safeties and linebackers and, and, and corners in certain instances. Um, the guy can run. There's no way he's running a 4-8. I'm just not buying it. You, he's faster than th most of these elite tight ends that we perceive to be elite pass catchers in this draft. Dallas Goddard. And those guys can move. He's faster than them. There's no way. And those guys are running 4-7-8s and 4-7-6s and things of that nature. Hayden Hurst was a 4-7-6 uh, guy or so. I think he might have even gotten to a four, six, eight at one point. He's running faster than Hayden Hurst. So I'm, I'm running with four, six, eight. Pass catching ability. He can get, look, X wide receiver. The man can catch the football. Have no doubts in my mind that this guy is a problem at the next level for most uh, defensive backs and linebackers that will try to cover this guy man to man. Quickness and suddenness shows that X wide receiver quickness. Good yards after uh, catch. Put this in my notes. Watch this guy juke a couple of dudes out of their shoes after the catch. Um, he's dangerous with the football in his hands, and he can also separate with that quickness um, in terms of route running ability. Speaking of which, we go to the next pro. I watched him versus Memphis and versus Auburn um, win. Run some beautiful outcuts and corner routes, but um, what he ran really well at Central Florida was a, a mesh route. And, and what a mesh route is, is when two receivers on opposite sides uh, run uh, shallow crossing routes that are supposed to free them up. And really what you're looking for with a mesh route seam combo is you're looking for man coverage and you're looking for that, that mesh route to run interference with the defensive backs or linebackers in this case. When that, when that receiver is coming across the formation, if the tight end times it up properly, he'll run it so that that, uh, corner will pick off the linebacker or safety, whomever is covering that tight end one-on-one. -on -one. And that allows you that one step you need. And if you have the speed that a Jordan um, Akins has, then that's all you need is that one step. And against Memphis, he catches a touchdown on that seam mesh combo. He also catches a nice one against Auburn up the seam on, on the same route. And all he needed was a step on that safety, Matthews, who was checking him, who was right in his hip pocket. But – that one step was all Aikens needed to get on top and get to the football. So I love his route running ability. I think he runs clean routes, sharp routes, which will allow him to win at the next level. Good catch radius at 6'3 um, with some longer arms. Um, toughness, I did see him drop the football versus Memphis in traffic. But also I saw him make catches in traffic versus Auburn. And Maryland, so I know he can. There were guys draped all over him in that Maryland game, and he made catch after catch after catch. Um, Auburn, there were some tough traffic catches in zone coverage over the middle of the football field where he knew uh, contact was coming, and it was coming very, very soon, and he still was able to go up, climb the ladder, go get the football, and brace for impact. So he's, there's an element of toughness here, and he's not afraid to stick his nose in and block as well, which we'll talk about here in a second. Speaking of which, run blocking ability. He competes as a blocker. He's nowhere near a finished product as a blocker. But the fact that he's willing to stick his nose in there, and, and similar to Ian Thomas, I think this guy with the right fundamentals shown to him, the right coaching, this guy could be a very good blocker in this league in addition to being an elite pass catcher. He doesn't have to be one of these guys like an OJ, OG85 who just simply is looking to catch the football and really wants no part of blocking like a Jordan Reed, he can morph into a guy that can be a serviceable blocker. May not be elite or dynamic as a blocker like a Travis Kelsey, but he may be a guy that can do it well enough, like a Vernon Davis, that can do it well enough that can give you a chance to be able to run the football in some instances. Um, awareness. I think he knows how to sit, and again, this is where that X wide receiver mentality kind of comes into play and really benefits him. 
knows how to sit down in zone, how to get into the soft spots of zone coverage. I watched him eat up zone coverage versus Auburn. Torched man coverage, though, versus Memphis in Maryland. So you put him in either situation and say, hey, look, man, need you to find a soft spot in this cover two defense. Or I need you to find a soft spot of this cover three. He knows how to sit down, get into a soft spot, make himself available. But if you give him an opportunity one-on-one -on -one against a linebacker, one-on-one -on -one against a safety, he can win those matchups as well. So like his awareness as to where to go, who to block in blocking situations. And he'll get better at that. There were some times where there was a missed assignment here or there, but he'll get better in terms of awareness. Versatility, this is also something you got to love with Jordan Aikens. Slot, offset, in line, out wide as a threat to catch the football. All of these are places where I saw him line up uh, pre-snap at Central Florida. Collegiate production, 2017 was his best season he had 32 catches for 515 yards and four touchdowns. 2016 as a tight end, 23 catches, 347 yards and two scores. So um, the production started to climb as he got more opportunities. And so I think he's trending in the right direction. And with an offense featuring a guy like Nuke on one side, Will Fuller, and now another guy that you drafted in this draft that can stretch the field, he's going to have plenty of opportunities to exploit the middle of the football field and some corner routes and things of that nature. Uh, this guy's going to be a problem, and I think he's going to be a, a huge addition, one that people are sleeping on for this Texans offense in the upcoming season. Red zone threat, only six career touchdowns in his career, so not a guy that was, was able to get into the end zone a ton, but I'm telling you right now, that number is going to swell with the ability of, one, Deshaun Watson and his legs and the threat of him running the football. He's going to free him up him being Jordan Akins, to get opportunities in the red zone, some easy ones at that. And then this guy's just simply going to win. And so I expect him to be a bigger red zone threat in the NFL than he was at college at Central Florida. But look, that's Jordan Akins. Again, another one of these guys that I don't have a lot of bad things and negative things to say. I think the future for this guy is so bright that I can understand taking him over Fumagalli for sure. We'll see if Ian Thomas and that selection turns out to be a mistake. I don't have a problem with this selection and him going before Ian Thomas. In the third round, 98th overall selection, tight end out of Central Florida, Jordan Akins, for me, is... This may be one of my favorite picks of this Texans draft, and I know that this guy's going to have a huge role for the Texans coming up in the next season. We'll talk about more of that on the other side of this, but fourth round, 103rd overall selection, wide receiver out of Texas A&M, Kevontany Cutie, or you know him as Kiki Cutie. This guy's got explosiveness written all over him, and they're, they're going to make beautiful music together in Houston. If, if Deshaun Watson is able to stay healthy, this guy is going to be a go-to type of weapon for him. And with what you already have, if this guy is what I think he could be at the next level, this guy's going to be a problem. Simply put, end of discussion, 5'10", 181, 14 reps of two and a quarter. I'm, I'm here to tell you, don't let the 5'10 buck 80 fool you. This guy's no chump, all right? You're not going to push this dude around. He's a lot tougher, plays a lot bigger than his size would indicate. I was so impressed with Kiki QT that I'm, I, I really think this could be the crown jewel of this draft when it's all said and done. Uh, 34 and a half inch vert. Um, five games of over 150 yards receiving in 2017. And he was the man at Texas uh, Tech in 2017. And I love guys that are the man coming out of college because every week the opposition knows we got to stop number two. We got to stop this guy. And he still goes out and touches it 10, 12, 15 times. And even though he's being keyed upon as a guy that we've got to stop, He's still making plays. He did that at Texas Tech. So it's always fun to watch a guy who the other team knows. And, and I don't give a damn if it's a bunch of 
uh, swing screens and jet sweeps and hitches and bubble. I don't give a damn how they get it to you. It's what you do when they get it to you. And when these opportunities come your way, what do you do with them? They give you single, single coverage. Guys playing cover three, trying to stay deeper than the deepest, and you smoke them. They give you one-on-one -on, -one on the outside, no help with the safety over the top, or he's coming to the party late. You smoke his ass. That's what Kevonti, that's what Kevontani, Kiki QT did at Texas Tech. Let's talk about Kiki QT and what he brings to the table. Um, measurables, 5, 10, buck 80. Not going to scare anybody, but I'm not opposed to it because I think this guy's going to do his work in the slot. And we know about the importance of the slot in today's NFL. Hands. The guy attacks the football, snatches it out of the air. Um, I, I didn't recall too many drops on tape. And, and he's a guy that attacks the football and goes after it. And he's a competitor, man. I really like what he brings to the table. Speed! 4-4-3-40. Four, four, the guy can flat out fly. I'm watching him smoke dudes um, on tape over and over and over again. And they know what's going on. They know what's going down. They know I can't let this guy get even. If I do, he's leaving. And they still get smoked. So this guy can flat out pick him up, put him down. Quickness and suddenness, this is why he's going to win at the next level in the slot is because his ability to get in and out of breaks, in and out of cuts, um, it's so easy. I watched him destroy. Speaking of which, let's go to route running. Um, I watched this guy. He's a smooth route runner. I put in my notes from the slot. Um, no wasted motion, a one stick and go type of guy. And all that simply means is he'll give you a head nod one way, stick his foot in the ground, and then he goes the other way. Uh, look, if you're a smooth route runner, if you're a quick guy with speed, there's no need to be a 3-4. Leave the 3 and 4 sticks for guys that need to do that because they aren't the most uh, explosive guy. A guy like Keenan Allen needs two or three sticks because he's not burning anybody. He needs to separate. He needs to give you that deceptiveness so that you don't know where he's going next. If I'm fast as hell, like Kiki QT, I don't need to give you three and four sticks. One stick, get you going in one direction, flip your hips, now I'm going out the other way. You don't have a shot of catching up to me, like he did against Baylor. Simple post corner, and it was just a post, but he, he sold him with the one stick to the corner, safety turns his hips outside, he goes inside, game over. Bad throw by the quarterback, he has to stop. He's got three full steps on his safety. Bad throw forces him to have to stop, change directions, jump in midair, and adjust to the football, plucks it, makes the safety miss, turns back on the burners, 80-yard touchdown, just like that. And the beauty of what this guy brings to the table is that he plays with the level of physicality. That's the next pro. Even though he's 5'10", buck 80, the guy plays with the level of physicality that you expect from a guy out wide that's 6'3", 210. He reminds me a lot of Steve Smith in that regard. He plays with a level of toughness, sort of like he's got a chip on his shoulder. And uh, I like that about uh, Kiki QT, um, and, which speaks to his toughness as well. Not afraid to go over the middle and make a catch if need be. Um, run after the catch. This dude is dangerous out in space. I put down in my notes, nasty out in space, freaked the dude versus Baylor, ducked under another one in, in a game versus Houston. So watch him catch the football out in, in the flats. Looks like an ordinary four or five yard game with his quickness. And he freaks a dude out in space, gives him an old one, two step like Sierra. Let me see you one, two step. Left the dude's draws over by the sidelines. Picked up another eight or nine yards on the play. And that's what this guy brings to the table. Um, against Houston, again, similar situation. Quick speed cut to the outside. Matter of fact, this one was on uh, a route, and they did this with him in 2017. They got creative with him. They'd line him up in the backfield. Um, they'd, they'd run him in motion and start to play with him at receiver start and snap the football with him in the backfield and then throw it to him on a swing screen. And so this is a situation where it looks like he's dead to right on the sideline, swing screen, uh, cuts it back. Ducks over a dude, ducks under a dude, and ends up getting like seven yards on a play that looked like it was dead on arrival uh, when he caught it two yards behind the line of scrimmage. So um, this guy is gonna, he's gonna get you yards after the catch. Just get it to him. He's got punt and kickoff return experience, and you see it when he gets the football in his hands. Um, leaping ability and high point in the football, it's much greater than you would expect from a 5'10 guy. So again, uh, you can you can miss the mark a little bit with him, and he'll still make you right in certain instances. Don't get too carried away. He is 5'10", 
but he's got a 34 and a half inch vert, so he can't climb the ladder and go and get the football. Uh, ball tracking ability. I watched him track a deep ball versus Houston for a touchdown, and it was funny watching him on that one because the defender thought he had a shot after Kiki QT went and got the football, and he went and got the football, and the guy is chasing him, and QT's taunting him as he's running to the end zone because he knows this guy can't catch him, and it's hilarious watching this guy try his hardest, and QT is kind of like got it on cruise control as he's going to the end zone. Um, excellent adjustment to the ball on the post that I told you about against Baylor where he smokes the safety on the post uh, route. Ball is behind him. Uh, not a good ball by Pat Mahomes on that particular th throw. He adjusts to it, uh, comes down with it, and then smokes everybody for an 80-yard touchdown. So he can track the football while in the air. Um, I love the fact that he was the guy at Texas Tech in 2017. Teams knew they had to stop him, and they still couldn't. So the dependability and the clutchness, I love it. When I know a guy is the guy going into the game, you got to stop him, and you still can't. Um, versatility, one of his biggest attributes is his versatility. Obviously, the speed and the ability to take the, the top off of defense is huge with this guy, and his ability to win in the slot is paramount. But the fact that this guy can give you some um, returnability as a punt and kickoff return, man, if you need to, um, had a, a kick return for a touchdown, uh, slot guy, deep threat. And you got to love the fact that he can take the top off the defense because with Will Fuller healthy, this Texans offense is damn near unstoppable in the pass game with Nuke on one side and Fuller on the other. But the problem is you don't know when Will Fuller is going to pull a hammy and be out for four weeks. And when you take that ability away to stretch the defense, it puts so much pressure on Nuke to have to produce by himself. You add in a guy like Kiki QT now, doesn't matter if Will Fuller's healthy or not, you still got another guy that can stretch the defense that they have to respect and pay attention to that's going to give Nuke opportunities to win some one-on-one -on -one matchups. Now, just imagine if both Nuke and uh, Will Fuller are healthy and you add Kiki QT into the mix and say a Jordan Aikens turns out to be what I think he's going to be, Try and stop this offense with Deshaun Watson's legs thrown into the equation, and let's figure out what happens at the running back position, if they get Foreman back healthy or not. Just, just try to stop that offense. Think about what this offense can be if this guy is what I think he's going to be, and I, I have no doubts. Akins is one thing, because you, you're not sure. I think I know what he's going to turn out to. I know what Kiki QT is. He's going to be a stud at the next level. If he's healthy, he's plot problematic, and sideline awareness – Great grab on the sidelines versus Houston where he looks down, gets both feet down in bounds as he's catching it before he steps out of bounds. And then, and here's the thing that you got to love, production. In 2016, he was just starting to get it with Pat Mahomes, 55 catches, 890 yards, seven touchdowns. He explodes in 2017 when he realizes, look, this is my last year. I'm going to light it up and then I'm gone. And the t other teams knew he was getting a rock. I mean, like I said, they created ways. Whether they put him in the backfield and they threw it to him from there, or they put him out wide, or they put him in the slot. They created ways to get him the football. 93 grabs for 1,429 yards and 10 touchdowns in, uh, to, at Texas Tech. And, and, you know, they love to throw it at Texas Tech. And, you know, he plays in the Big 12, so take it with a grain of salt. But, look, the dude is a beast. Um, quickly, his cons, um, blocking. Look, he's 5'10", a buck 80, and even though um, – I compared him earlier to Steve Smith in the way that he plays the game. He doesn't block like Steve Smith. All right. Um, he tries, but he's just not adept at blocking. And um, he'll get in the way from time to time, but he's 5'10", a buck 80. If someone really wants to get by him, they can. That being said, man, there's a lot to love here. In the fourth round, 103rd overall selection, wide receiver out of Texas Tech. Keep Bontany, cutie. You know as Kiki Cutie. So we move on to the sixth round, and the Texans had about three picks in the sixth round as well. We're extremely busy here uh, as well. 177th selection overall. Edge rusher out of Wake Forest, Duke Edgefor is the selection. So this is a guy that I'm really intrigued by, and I think much like Martinez Rankin, 
His score ultimately, I think, is going to elevate itself if he is who I think he is. Right now, I can't give him the benefit of the doubt because of the drop-off in production in 2017. But from what I saw on tape, he's not explosive. We'll talk about that here in a second. But what he is is a polished pass rusher. He's polished, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit later on too. 6'3", 264, tremendous size uh, as an edge rusher. Shoulder surgery sidelined him from any pre-draft workout. So we didn't get to see how much he could rep on the bench. We didn't get to see him run at the combine, didn't run at his pro day, so we can't put speed. Uh, but I can tell you right now, he's not overly explosive. So um, from that standpoint, but career numbers, 23 and a half sacks, four forced fumbles, 43 tackles for loss, six pass breakups in his career, 10 and a half sacks in 2016, but only six and a half in 2017. And maybe that shoulder injury that he ended up having sh uh, surgery on in the offseason maybe uh, to do for some of uh, the drop off there. I'm not one to blame that. If you play, you play. And if you play, I need you to be productive. If you can't play, then sit down. But I don't want to hear any excuses when it's all said and done. That being said, measurables. Love his measurables at 6'3", 264. Athleticism, he's a solid athlete, but he's not going to floor you with his athleticism. Let's just get that out of the way right now. Explosiveness, I told you already, I don't think he's very explosive at all, but he's explosive enough to where he threatens your outside shoulder if you're a tackle to make you respect him up the field on your outside shoulder to where it opens up some opportunities inside, and Duke Edge of Four understands that, which – kind of alludes to what I mentioned earlier about him being a polished pass rusher. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Hand usage, really solid, understands the 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 necessary the, the necessity to use your hands in defeating a blocker in front of you. Uh, awareness, tackle for loss versus Texas A&M in his final collegiate game in the bowl game versus Texas A&M in what was a shootout. Running back runs a flare route and and Duke Edgefor was not responsible for this guy. Again, we're talking about a defensive end here. Wasn't responsible for this running back out of the backfield, but he quickly realized no one was covering this guy. He runs this flare route. He's going to be wide open and pick up about 12 to 15 if Edgefor doesn't get out of his stance and immediately shoot to the outside and go make a tackle for a loss. Gorgeous play. Just shows that this guy was thinking pre-snap and as things developed, quickly reacted to what he saw and he guessed right, and he made a play. Setting the edge, he's physical in the run game in terms of setting the edge, which that 265-pound frame does come in handy in that regard. Uh, redirects well, can change directions, and get to the ball carrier. Ability versus the run, like I said, sets a physical edge in the run game. If not blocked, he's dangerous on the backside of plays, uh, coming down and making plays that way. Pass rush ability, this is the thing that I, I'm most excited about this guy's future about is, um, I look at this guy, and he's got what I call a, a bag of tricks. Bag of tricks is as I call it. He's got a tool belt. He can go with the rip, he can go with the spin, and he can go with the swim. All are equally effective. The one thing that doesn't scare you as much is the fastball. If you were a pitcher, his fastball might be clocking in at anywhere from 89 to 91. No one's afraid of that, Right. But it's the other pitches that really get you thinking. Look, the fastball is still respectable at 91, if you can get it there. So that has you looking fastball. Then the changeup is 79. That's a nice discrepancy from 79, from 91 to 79. That's a lot of difference there. And then he's got a nasty split that's in the dirt. Looks like a strike, falls off the table. That's what the spin move is, okay? You're going speed outside, speed outside. And now I'm coming with something that looks like a fastball, and then it falls off the damn table. I'm spinning inside, and you don't have a chance. Spin move is gorgeous, too. It gains ground as he does it. It goes up the field, takes him towards the quarterback. It's gorgeous. It's well-timed, and it's well-executed. He's going to beat some dudes with that spin move. His rip move, it's nice. It's quick. It's to the point. Um, and so is his swim. Both are equally good. He sets you up hard outside. Bam, swim back inside. Gotcha. All right. Now you can walk because of the lack of explosiveness. That next step isn't explosive to the point where you can't wash him inside if you've got 
quick re recovery skills as a tackle. But if you lack the ability to switch directions, to change after guessing wrong, if you're one of those guys that don't have the ability to recover quickly, he's going to beat you to the quarterback. Um, his motor and endurance are outstanding. So is his tackling ability. Impact on the game because this guy has all of those different tools. He's able to impact the game by getting his hands on football, by attacking the quarterback. And again, he may not get to the quarterback for a sack, but it's his pressure that makes the quarterback uncomfortable. And this is something that most guys that are edge rushers coming into the league just simply doesn't have. He does. He's got a PRP. What is a PRP? Pass rush plan. He's setting guys up. You can see him. You can see his brain working. You can see him. I'm going hard outside these next two plays. Then I'm coming with the swim move. I'm going hard outside the next three plays after that. Then I'm coming with the spin. Got him. He's setting tackles up for what's to come down the road. Guys don't usually have that. They don't usually learn it until they get to the next level. Duke Ejiofor is coming into the NFL with the ability to set tackles up to get to the quarterback. I love that. I think that this guy has a chance to be a triple. I probably should have given him one. He probably deserves one, but that drop off in 2017 scared me. I want to see how his lack of explosiveness affects him at the next level because if he's able to threaten tackles on the edge with just enough speed to get them thinking, I feel like the rest of his traits and the rest of his tricks that he has in his bag that he's developed over time will allow him to be a menace that can put pressure on the quarterback um, and really give you some more pressure opposite of Whitney Merciless. If this guy is what I think he can be, you may have something here in the sixth round. This could be a steal for you. And I might, I might have shortchanged him, but I'm going to stick with what I decided in the sixth round, 177th overall selection. Edge rusher out of Wake Forest, Duke Edge of is... As we move right along in the sixth round, 211th selection out of Mississippi State, tight end Jordan Thomas is the selection. So this is your second time shopping at the Mississippi State store in this draft. Earlier, you took Martinez Rankins out of Mississippi State. Now you take one of his teammates on the offensive side of the football, Jordan Thomas. And um, here's another tight end with some freakish athleticism for his size at 6'6", 265. This guy at one point was 280 pounds. And to watch him move around on a football field at 280 speaks volumes to the ability that this guy has from an athletic standpoint. 16 reps of two and a quarter. This guy was a Juco transfer that at one point was 280 pounds, as I referenced. And at times, they would line him up out wide at Mississippi State. All right. Um, I, I was just amazed at watching this guy run around and, and do some of the things he was able to do on the football field. His production doesn't necessarily match up his talents. And at times, I thought he was um, used incorrectly at Mississippi State. I didn't think he got enough reps. And they had a number of guys that they liked at the tight end position. So they would rotate them in. And there were a lot of times where Jordan Thomas wasn't getting enough reps or he was asked to do things out wide as a receiver and which just speaks volumes to his athleticism, and then some of that speaks to the lack of um, studs at the receiver position. Nonetheless, the quarterback position wasn't the greatest. Um, they started to get a little bit of production later on in his career, but um, this is a guy that is just scratching the surface as a tight end. Um, no game in his career did he have over 65 yards receiving, not a single one, which, again, begs the question, what is this guy capable of? We really don't know. You really didn't get to see it in college. Uh, they still have a quarterback that is just really starting to figure it out. Had a really good season last year, but still isn't where he needs to be to be to distribute the football um, correctly, quickly, accurately at times. So uh, Jordan Thomas is one of the guys that may have suffered because of it. Nonetheless, measurables at 6'6", 265, off the charts. Um, his speed and, and athleticism is, for his size, just amazing. Um, 469.40 for Jordan Thomas at that size. And again, you're talking about a guy that uh, got down to 265 uh, for the combine. This guy was every bit of 280 during his time at Mississippi State. Pass catching ability, he can catch the football. He can catch the football. So 
Um, again, this is one of those guys that I think if you give him opportunities, he'll prove to you that he can do some things that maybe we didn't get to see him do at Mississippi State. Quickness and suddenness. Um, not the quickest guy in the world, but there is a little bit of suddenness to what this guy does as a route running uh, uh, tight end um, at Mississippi State. Route running ability, it's solid. It's not going to knock your socks off. I think his size just alone is enough for him to win. And we always talk about the three ways to separate in this league. Quickness, speed, or their ability to, to just win with size, okay? You've either got to have one of the three. You've either got to be extremely fast, you've either got to be extremely quick, or you just need to have size. Well, this guy has size. So even though his quickness isn't going to be the greatest, and I think he has enough quickness to win, against most um, defensive backs and, and uh, linebackers, he's got size. There's not going to be anyone checking him 6'5", 6'6". He's got the size that if you just put it outside on his outside shoulder, he's going to be able to box guys out for the football. Catch radius is tremendous with this guy. Toughness is solid. Uh, run blocking ability, they, they put him at the head of their um, trips formations, their bunch formations. And they would ask him to block in some run situations. They would ask him to block on some wide receiver screens and hitches and things of that nature. So um, he, he has the ability to block. They asked him to do that quite a bit at Mississippi State. I didn't see him stay in to block very often uh, as a pass blocker. So can't really speak to whether he's really adept at that or not. So I didn't ding him on that. Awareness is solid as to who to block. Um, Still think he needs to work on situations where man versus zone, do I sit down, do I keep running? You, you know, those are situations where you've got to be smart and understand what the defense is doing and what your response to that needs to be as a tight end. Um, versatility, uh, he was a guy that lined up out wide, uh, offset, in line as a blocker. So, uh, again, this is a guy that you can do a lot of different things with, uh, which speaks to – today's NFL and what you have to do as a tight end and how versatile you need to be. Jordan Thomas is one of those guys. Uh, collegiate, let's get to his cons quickly. Um, collegiate production, like I said, no game over 65 yards receiving. So in 2016, nine catches for eight for 48 yards and one touchdown. 2017, 22 catches for 263 yards and three scores. So again, not going to blow you away with the collegiate production. Some of it his fault, some of it not. Um, Stamina and red zone threat, uh, neither one of those were great. And again, when you're 280, I don't expect you to be out there running around and not get tired. But um, he was off the field quite a bit. And some of that, again, may not be his fault. They may have had some tight ends that they really liked, that they played over him in some situations that they thought were beneficial to the team. But um, he just wasn't on the field enough for me at times. So uh, in any event, I like this election because I think this guy's ceiling, much like Aiken's, it's tremendous. Do I think that he could be as good as Aikens? No. I think Aikens has a different skill set than Jordan Thomas, but don't be surprised if this guy ends up helping you in some shape, form, or fashion in 2018. In the sixth round, 211th selection, tight end out of Mississippi State, Jordan Thomas for me is. As we move on, three picks later in the sixth round, 214th selection, edge rusher out of Stanford, Pilo, Peter Kal Kalambai is the selection. So Peter Kalambai is a very intriguing prospect and not in a good way for me. I watched this guy on tape several times and I watched more tape and I hate when I got to watch more tape than I normally watch because I was expecting him to show me something eventually. I figured the more tape I watch, I'd uncover something that maybe I didn't find in the previous three or four games and it was just more of the same. So I came to a conclusion that I just don't know what this guy does. So um, Peter Kalambai is um, 6'3", 252 pounds, 19 reps of two and a quarter, 34-inch uh, vert, so there's some explosiveness there, 18 and a half career sacks, and like 10 of them came early on in his career, like eight or 10 of them came in like his first year playing, you know, and then it, it was a, a drop-off steadily as the years progressed. 
two and a half force, uh, two forced fumbles, seven PBUs, 28 tackles for loss, 33 inch arms. So this guy is built um, very solidly, good explosiveness. Um, his athleticism, four, five, seven, forty. He can run, and, and again, the thirty-four inch vert kind of speaks to that. So I was expecting a guy that would be a lot more explosive off the edge. Didn't get it. Um, I, you saw the, the the explosiveness though when he was out in space. He dropped in the coverage versus K State, and the quarterback rolls out trying to extend the play, and he comes out of nowhere. This uh, Peter Kalen uh, Bayi and um, didn't get the tackle, but. It was a third down and three, um, or fourth down and three, excuse me. He got a piece of him, slowed him down. Here comes the Calvary. Quarterback stopped short, turnover on down, Stanford ball. Uh, and, he, and he closed the distance so quickly there. So you saw the explosion there. But when it comes to him lining up in a four-point or a three-point stance, um, hell, even a two-point st stance off the edge, I just didn't see it off the snap. I didn't see him blowing by. Not a single time did I see him blow by a guy. And I'm like, oh, okay, there it is. No, never saw it. Um, the awareness is solid, especially when he's over the slot and he comes in almost like a blitzer off the edge. Um, sets a solid edge in the run game. Redirect his quality. Um, ability versus the run is solid, but he doesn't stack and shed. If you block him, to me, he's a weak side linebacker at the next level. He's he's not a strong side guy. He's not a guy you want up close to the line of scrimmage. You don't. I saw tight ends whoop his ass in the run game. And when I say whoop is I'm not talking about taking him and driving him. As a tight end, you're not looking to devour a guy. You're just looking to do your job. And if you're an edge rusher, your job is to not let a tight end whoop your ass. Your job is to not let the tight end feel comfortable enough blocking you and sealing you off and keeping you from making a play. You should take pride as an edge rusher in beating the block of any tight end. No tight end should feel comfortable blocking you as an edge rusher. I think tight ends would feel really comfortable blocking Peter Kalambaiti. So, um, tackling ability, once he has a chance, he's, he's pretty good at getting guys down on the ground. Coverage skills, he's a guy that likes to drop over um, in hook zones. He's a guy that will line up over the slot and kind of just rove around and be that um, kind of lurking defender, if you will, kind of reading the eyes of the quarterback, seeing if he can't get in the mix. Um, really good motor and endurance. He's a guy that will hustle, give you everything he's got while he's on the football field. Um, Impact on the game is solid just because they moved him around at Stanford. But, again, not one quality was redeeming enough to where I'm, like, blown away uh, as we get to his cons. Hand usage didn't exist as a pass rusher, which um, if you're not going to be extra explosive, then you better have something else that helps you get to the quarterback, and he just didn't. He either tried to win with speed off the edge that didn't work or a bull rush that was really fleeting after an initial pop it would slow down and, and guys would be able to uh, kind of recover, stick their feet in the ground and hunker down. Um, pass rushing ability, I didn't see any of it. I didn't see anything. The 18 and a half sacks might as well have been two and a half sacks. I didn't see it. And I watched enough games to where I should have seen something that was encouraging. His sacks were on second, third, fourth efforts. Guy running around for way too long and here comes Peter Kalambayi to clean him up. Um, Pass rush plan, there isn't one. There is absolutely no plan in place for uh, Peter Kalambayi when he's going after the quarterback. Um, he's just hoping he gets there, hoping the tackle makes a mistake, has a bad set, and he's able to win. But that, it's just not what he does. And so um, here's my thing. Here's my thing on, on Peter Kalambayi is that I watched him in enough games that I should have seen something that stood out for, for, for me. And – uh, if you're a really good player in college, they don't take you off the field. Okay, even if they're guys that they really like that they want to get on the field, get some experience for, they're not taking you off the field to do so. They're not taking you off the field and getting guys on the field at your expense unless you're tired. But there would be two, three straight possessions where they would swap in other guys and Peter Kalambay wouldn't even be on the field. And they were okay with that because they didn't feel like they were missing anything when he wasn't on the field. So what that tells me is that there isn't one thing that he does extremely well. There's a, a bunch of things that he's, he's okay at. And at the next level, I don't know if that's good enough for this guy to earn a roster spot or be any. And, and if he is 
going to do something well, here's the one thing that I see that he could potentially do well. He could be a nickel linebacker. In nickel sets, where you need a guy with a little bit of size that's not going to hurt you at 252 pounds if a team decides to try to spread you out to run it. He's not going to hurt you because he's not light in the, in the pants. Um, he won't hurt you in that regard if a team decides to spread you and run it. But he can also drop into space, four, five, seven. He can move, and he, he's fluid out of space. He's not a fish out of water when he has to drop it at a 90-degree at a, at a angle or has to drop it at a 45-degree angle and get it in the hook zone. And, and he's kind of clever and keying quarterback's eyes and kind of being that lurker defender. If there's one thing that I think he could potentially be good at, it'd be a nickel linebacker. But right now, I, I just I don't see it. I don't see the value in Peter Kalambayi here in the sixth round, 214th overall selection. Stanford edge rusher Peter Kalambayi for me is So we wrap up this Texans draft in the seventh round, 222nd overall selection, defensive back out of San Jose State. Jermaine Kelly is the selection. So here we go quickly on Jermaine Kelly. 6'1", buck 96, out of San Jose State, played in 25 games while at San Jose State, started 17 of them, transferred from the University of Washington. You could look at it one of two ways. Uh, one, you could look at it in a situation where maybe the coaching staff was turned over. He didn't like the coach that came in, decided to flip because they had some, some turnover there, um, and the guy that recruited him may not have been the coach there anymore, and he wanted out. Or you could look at it like this. He just simply wasn't good enough. From a school that has just delivered corner after corner after corner after corner, okay? Whether you're talking Kansas City thief, now turned Los Angeles thief in Marcus Peters, or you're talking Kevin King, or you're talking about Sidney Jones, they've delivered corner after corner after corner. Why would you leave that school? Maybe you weren't good enough to get on the field. And that's probably more along the lines of what it was. In any event, 17 career PBUs, 12 of them came in 2017. Only one career interception, that also came in 2017. Now, it was a pick six versus Utah State, which I got to see, but I'm not blown away by what this guy brings to the table, but he is a hell of a special teams player. That's going to give him a shot to make this roster, but quickly. Measurables at 6'1", buck 96, not that bad, especially being 6'1", with a little bit of length. That, that's a quality that can come into handy. 448, 40, so he can run. So that's going to give him a shot as well. Athleticism, he's a really solid athlete. Good acceleration, good change of direction and agility. Anticipation and awareness, uh, that's a con, so we'll come back to that. Look, locate, and contest. He's an LLCer. He will look back for the football, which you know I am absolutely a huge fan of. One of my pet peeves is corners that don't look back for the football. Jermaine Kelly isn't one of those guys, so from that standpoint, I can rock with Jermaine Kelly because I know once he gets in a comfortable position, he's going to look back for that football and see if he can't make a play on it. Ball skills is another con. We'll come back to that. Tackling tackling, and willingness to tackle. He's willing to throw his, uh, uh, his um, frame in the mix. He's willing to throw his hat in there and see if he can't help get guys down on the ground, so I don't have a problem with him there. Uh, man coverage ability, I like him better in man coverage than I do zone. I hate when he plays off, however, which he does quite a bit of. Uh, he gives up too many easy completions underneath. But in any event, I think he's much better in man because he's he, I, he has the ability to stay in a guy's hip pocket and locate ball. Um, I don't like him in zone. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, but blitzing capabilities, I saw him blitz a couple of times. I think he's got the potential to really be a nuisance as a blitzer at the next level if used correctly. I saw him almost hit home a couple of times. I think he can be a guy that you can use as a blitzer at the next level. And then versatility, uh, he's a guy that can play in the slot. And as a boundary corner, they tried him at both at San Jose State. More of a boundary guy than a slot guy, but in any event, I think he can do a little bit of both. Here's his cons. Um, anticipation and awareness. To me, A, he's too nosy. So we'll talk about that here in a second. But his awareness for a guy that wants to be extreme. If you're extremely nosy, that means you should be jumping shit. Like, don't be nosy and then be hesitant at the same time. Those two things don't mix. 
You're going to be nosy. You better be ready to jump on this goddamn slant you sitting on. You're going to be nosy. Your guy's supposed to be on the outside. You're supposed to be in cover three. And you got the deeper, you got the deepest third over there. You better not miss on this goddamn in cut if you're being nosy. And so he's outside in, in zone coverage. Right by the end zone. And his guy, Darian Carrington, runs uh, a simple two, three-yard stop, a little hitch. And he's eyeballing quarterback the entire time. And the quarterback comes back to the hitch late. If you coming back to a hitch late, that's a call. That's a house call. I'm sitting on this. I'm watching you. You come back to this hitch. He's right in front of me. Oh, you asking for trouble, man. All the way to the outer hash. Trouble, man. And he lets the guy, not only does he let him complete the hitch, he misses the damn tackle and gives up a touchdown. Six yards. Pick that shit off. He, he's just not built like that. Um, ball skills. He's only got one career INT. I, I just, I need production. I need, and for a guy that looks, he looks for the rock. Watch him drop one against Texas. Right in his damn hands. I don't know if his ball skills are all that great. Uh, zone coverage ability. He's so damn nosy. Do your job. And again, I don't have a problem with you being nosy if you're going to be a thief. Marcus Peters is one of the most nosiest corners in the league. Always doing some shit that he ain't got no business doing. But you know what he does? He does a great job of baiting a quarterback. Yeah, I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to be here. I know I'm supposed to be on this out of third, staying deeper than the deepest, and this, this receiver's trying to run me off, and you're trying to throw this out cut, and I probably should be running with this receiver, but I know I can bait you into throwing this out cut so I can undercut it and run it back for six. Jermaine Kelly ain't doing that. He's nosy, and he's giving shit up. And it's a two-way go. So if you're going to allow a guy in the slot to be eye candy, on a post that that's not your business that is not your business because there's a safety in the middle of the field that's supposed to take care of that post route but there's a guy running a seam ball or, or running up excuse me a fade up the sidelines that's your responsibility but let that i candy you can't take your eyes off of it now the guy is behind you and the quarterback's throwing the football to him he's just too nosy for me for a guy that's not making plays he loses sight of his responsibility way too often. Um, so from that standpoint, I can't get with him. But he plays special teams. He's long, and he can run. There are spots in the league for guys like this, and I think because of everything I just said, and he looks for the football, a guy like Jermaine Kelly in the seventh round, 222nd pick out of San Jose State, has a chance to make this Houston Texans roster. We'll see. But nonetheless, he finishes up this draft as So not bad for new Texans GM Brian Gain, his first time out the gate making picks. There were some questionable decisions in this draft. Um, obviously, the one everyone wanted to debate was the pick of tight end Jordan Akins in the third round over guys like uh, Troy Fumagalli, and most notably Ian Thomas, who is very similar, but probably further along in his process. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with it at all. As a matter of fact, I like that selection, and I think that that selection could prove to be huge for this Texans team moving forward. My favorite pick, without a doubt, was Kiki QT out of Texas Tech in the fourth round. I think you may have gotten a steal there. And so uh, I think obviously the biggest steal, though, was getting uh, a guy like Justin Reed in the third round with your first selection. To sit out the first two rounds, it's tough. Um, some of that your own doing trading back, nonetheless. Thought it was a quality draft. Here's how it ended up being scored. So remember, if you want to see the Texans' scores for each individual player, go to this website, louisTnetwork.net. 
All the scores there will be listed for this Texans team and their draft and each individual player. Also, make sure you're checking out the website periodically as the content there changes. Also, make sure you're uh, tuned in to the Louis T Network on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And check out the podcast, Louis T Network Podcast on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Music Play, and also, of course, on the website, LouisTNetwork.net. I'm your man, Louis T, signing off. Nice draft for the Texans, starting out with Brian Gain, and I think they've done some things to improve the explosiveness of this offense. Really excited about the things that they have uh, in place now, and if they're healthy, they're dangerous in Houston. It's going to do it for your man, Louis T. Plenty more of these where this came from, so you stay tuned. We're changing the game one video at a time. I will see you next time. Have a go. Louis T.